so we have heard a lot of uh, measurements of the new transkill from uh, with Adonis Frost from yesterday and this morning's presentation. Now I will give you a different aspect of the new transkill thickness measurement that is with the electromagnetic uh, scattering. So uh, I guess most people in this room have a background in uh, heavy arm conditions. Therefore, I will introduce the experimental setup for PDAX2 and CDAX, and I will show you the data analysis and result from our uh, PDAX2 and CDAX measurements. Finally, I want to say a few words about uh, transverse asymmetries. That's a bonus of both PDAX2 and CDAX. So, Despite the development of modern nuclear physics, there's some, we don't have clear answers to some uh, fundamental questions like what's the size of a nucleus, especially heavy nucleus that is dominated by neutrons. And we don't know the nuclear saturation density. So we know this concept, we know it's there, but we never have a direct observation of its quantity. And we don't know the symmetry energy. So this and its density dependence at the saturation density. So these are all key parameters of the equation of states, but we don't have clear answer to, the, to these questions. So all these questions actually comes down to a, to a same question, that is how are neutrons that distributed in atomic nuclei? Well, actually it's about uh, nucleons, but because we already know, we, already, we have a quite uh, good understanding and precise measure of proton distributions, therefore, this problem comes down to a neutron distribution. So to know the new, uh, neutron distributions, one may start with the proton distributions because that's well measured, as you can see here. That's all these blue, part, blue dots represent uh, experimental measurements. So that for uh, like lead 208 or calcium 48, these are neutron rich nuclei because they have more neutrons than protons. Therefore, we can see that it, so we assume, if we assume that similar distribution of between neutrons and protons, that's, that's a reasonable assumption. Then we can see that because there's more neutrons, we, if you have a larger point uh, radius than the protons. So that's the, uh, the difference between the point neutron and the point proton. So this formula, the difference between them will be the, the what we call a neutron spin thickness and a point uh, proton or point neutron radius is defined in a left formula. But this picture, well, this is a simple and intuitive pictures. The deep reason for the neutron spin is noted in the so-called symmetry energy that's related to the equation of state that we already learned from that is presentation. But anyway, I will repeat that here. So if we start with the uh, uh, liquid drop models, that is simple but effective models. So the binding energy of a nucleus will be shown as this formula. So that the first term is the volume term, and the second term is the surface term, the third term is the Coulomb term. That's, uh, that's a correction due to a Coulomb interaction between of protons. The third term comes from the Pauli exclusion principles, and the fifth term is a small correction come from the spin coverings. So, uh, for general discussions that we can ignore the uh, fifth term, that's a small correction. And then for our discussion on the uh, general discussion of, of the uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear systems, that we need, just need to focus on the strong interactions. Therefore, we also ignore the uh, Coulomb interactions. And finally, for the, for the most common limits, that is the infinite systems, then we don't need to consider the surface term. Therefore, we come to the uh, equation of state function, that is the energy per nucleon will be uh, this way, that is only the volume term and the asymmetry term. So for an infinite system, well, it's better to describe that in terms of density rather than the number of protons or number of neutrons. Therefore, we will have the formula, the equation of states for uh, for a nuclear system, that the energy of the system will depend on the density of the neutrons and the density of the protons. So from equation of states, then we can get some uh, some important parameters. So let the, the coefficient, uh, the S-low here, will be what we call a symmetry energy. 
and then we can expand this symmetry energy uh, along the circulation density that's low mass. Then the uh, the constant term will be the symmetry energy. This is a symmetry energy at the density uh, circulation density, and then it's a uh, first order derivative with respect to density. This is what called L value. So these uh, two values, the S uh, and L values, that that's the that will describe the equational states that will have a wide application. So one common uh, and important application is the determination of the radius of uh, neutron stars. So you can see this is left hand side shows you the carton of uh, neutron stars. So despite the eighteen orders of magnitude difference in their size. There's femtometer in neutron skin and a kilometer in neutron stars. They, well, I would say they share the same equation of states. So for neutron stars, because that's, we have only new, well, most neutrons, therefore we can have a beta approximately to one. Then we, we can get is the energy uh, of the system of a neutron star. So from this energy uh, equation of states, we can derive this pressure. And this pressure, is correlated to is uh, to the radius of the neutron stars. So this is an observation by Jason Latima. So he found that that the for cold neutron stars that the radius of the neutron star is somehow correlated. So you can see that uh, with the pressure of the outer class, and this C is a uh, as a coefficient depend on the density and the mass of the neutron star. So if we if we measure the the uh, uh, well, so I want to mention that error value here. So strictly, error should be a quantity, a value that is the density dependence at the cellular density. But sometimes people also use it as a function that is the density dependence of the symmetry energy. So I will just misuse it here. If it has a low dependence, it means it's a function, otherwise it's just a value. So that once we measure the error at the saturation density, then we will infer the neutron uh, radius of a neutron star. Unfortunately, being such an important quantities, uh, we don't have quite good understanding of these quantities. So you can see that here shows you a series of models that can uh, correctly fit with our observations, like the binding energy, mass, rate, uh, charge radius of various nuclear, nuclei. But you see that they have a uh, very different uh, prediction of the symmetry energy. And if somehow we can measure the neutron schemes uh, of lab, in lab 2 a, then as you can see in the right cross, we will be able to identify the L values in the neutron equation of states. So this is why it's important of P rex 2 and C rex. Of course, uh, in terms of the neutron scheme itself, we have some theoretical predictions, both from the initial uh, calculations and uh, density functional theory. So as you can see here, the uh, top cross is a uh, prediction of the neutron scale thickness in lab 208 from uh, cluster, couple cluster calculations. And the uh, bottom left cross shows you the uh, uh, radius of neutrons in neutron uh, calcium 48 and in lab 208 predicted by a series of density functional theory, density functional theories. So the uh, uh, less blue and uh, red one represent non relativity and relativity uh, calculations. So we see that they have, these theories have quite uh, different predictions. So if we can measure the uh, neutron skin thickness precisely, then we will be able to constrain the parameter space of these uh, theoretical models. So, uh, what we are going to do is to use the elect, actually the weak pros, because as we can see here, neutral is new, uh, neutron is neutral, therefore we cannot use the electron mag magnetic pros as we do for uh, protons. But the weak, as you can see in the plus here, because uh, when we scatter electrons from a uh, uh, nucleus, we actually cannot distinguish the weak, uh, the weak neutral currents and the elect electromagnetic currents. Therefore, we, what we actually is what we actually measure is the asymmetries between the cross section of right-handed uh, electron scatter of the 
nucleus and left-handed electron scatter of the nucleus. So less asymmetry comes from the interference between the weak currents and the electron mag magnetic currents. So compared to the hard close methods, that the weak measurements that our result will be clean. There's no model dependence to integrate our results. So as I said, that the asymmetry comes from uh, interference, as you can see, because the uh, gamma colors interact with only the vector colors, while well, the uh, uh, weak colors interact with both the vector and axial vector colors. So you can see that the asymmetries finally will uh, derive to be the ratio of the weak form factors with respect to the charge form factors. And this quantity has been precisely measured. So once we measure the asymmetries, then we'll be able to uh, get the weak form factors. So this quantity uh, asymmetry, what we are going to measure, as you can see here, is a very tiny uh, values. So it's at the parts per, part per million levels. But PLS 2 NCS is able to uh, measure this tiny quantity very precisely. So we have we can achieve a um, uh, relative uncertainty less than 4%. So that's corresponding to the uncertainty in the neutron skin about 0 0.05 hundred Okay, now we come to the experimental setup. So both experiments are done uh, in COI and JDAP. So let's, the left-hand side shows you the CBAP accelerator. So this means that the continuous electron being accelerating facilities. So that uh, polarized electrons will be produced in the source as the pink part here. Uh, inject into the CBAP accelerator, it will be accelerated in the north linear and the south linear. Once it reaches the desired energy, so for PLX2 is about 1 GeV and for CLX is about 2.2 GeV, then it will be ejected in the exit of the south linear and then it will deliver to the experimental house. The right hand side shows you the bird view of the how it, how it looks like. The electron comes from the left hand side and then we'll uh, hit the target. The target is that's around the center of hall A. And then the will receive by the two high resolution spectrometer. So you can see that each HRS consists of three uh, quadruples and one dipoles. And then finally received by detectors atop the HRS. So for our experiment, first, of course, we need to have polarized source that will be produced by uh, material by material called uh, guardian arsenate based semiconductors. So you can see here is the energy band of this material. Once you shoot in a laser with energy between E gap and E gap plus delta, then you will excite electrons in P states to the S states. Mm -hmm. So the extracted uh, electrons from S state will be polarized. And the transition rate can be calculated from quantum mechanics of course. Then you'll get finally get polarized uh, electrons. So as you can see here, we can get, uh, so with this original material, we can get about 50% uh, polarization. So to improve the polarizations, one can try to degenerate the p-state here. So that's done by a technique called a strainic guardian arsenic. Let's just add another layer. That's the strainic guardian arsenic layers. Then you will degenerate the p-states. Therefore, you get pure uh, polarized states. Of course, this is the ideal case. In reality, P, uh, electron source uh, at CBAP can achieve about 90% polarization. So uh, with uh, only polarized, polarized source is not enough. We need to freak the polarization of the electron beams uh, very fast because we, we, are matched, we want to have a pre uh, high precision measurements. Therefore, we need to make sure that the difference between the being with different holistics as small as possible. So the first uh, holistic reversal is done by a component called a focus cell. So this is based on the focus effects that will transform a linearly polarized laser beam into a circularly polarized laser beam. So if you change the, the uh, polarity of the voltage applied to the focus cell, then it will free the phase of the laser beams by pi, therefore it will free the uh, holistic of the laser, therefore free the holistic of the electrons. Besides, we also have two other components called the insertable halfway phase and wind filters that 
So uh, this one, as in this one, is halfway place. So it's like here. You can just insert or recheck it from the laser beams, uh, from the laser pad. Therefore, it will change the phase of the laser by pi. Therefore, we will free the uh, polarity of the laser. Therefore, change free the polarity of the electrons. While the wind filters is a series of magnets, it will manipulate the speed of the electron directly. So uh, this, uh, this both uh, in several half plates and the wind filters are used to control the systematic uncertainty of our measurements. Uh, one other function of wind filters is that it will set up a non-zero kick of uh, horizontal spin directions because of the spin precession in the accelerators. So in order to get exactly horizontal polarization in the house, it, it need to have a non-zero horizontal spin, uh, non-zero horizontal, uh, longitudinal polarizations in the uh, injectors. So let, let us stand by the wind filter. <coughs> so in a house, we have two spectrum uh, parameters to measure the polarization of the electron beams. One is called uh, molar parameter, the other one is the uh, compound parameter. So as that name implies, they use the, either the molar scattering or the compound scattering to measure the asymmetry of the um, molar scattering or the compound scattering, then derive the polarization of the electron beams. So molar is more precise, but its measurement is invasive. Therefore, it doesn't happen frequently. Uh, while compound uh, is non-invasive, therefore we use it to monitor the polarization of our electron beams. So here is the uh, result that they measure for QLX2 and CLX. So after electrons scatter out the targets, they will firstly go to the, a series of magnet called septum because our design value, the scattering angle is very small, only about five degrees, but the practical limitation of the HRS, that's about 12.5 degrees. Therefore, we need extra set uh, magnets to bridge them. And the high resolution spectrum, spectrometer, as it is in price, that it has a very high resolution in terms of the measurement of the electron momentum. So you can see that a little difference in the electron momentum will cause a large shift in the detector planes. Therefore, it enables us to reject most inelastic scattings. So this is a detector. Well, this may be much simpler compared to most heavy ion experiments, the detector you use. So the main counting of the electrons is done by these two so-called uh, pulse detectors. So we run it in the so-called integrating mode. That is, we will come integrate all electrons scattered in one collective windows. And there are some other detectors like GENS that's used for optic studies. This will you the chart we collect uh, here in PLEX2 and CLEX. So we run about three months for PLEX2 and we collect about 130 uh, charge. And for CLEX, because of the uh, COVID shutdown, so it has, we have two separate uplownings and we collect about uh, 450 charge amount that is about 380 good charge. Now come to the data analysis. So uh, we, the law asymmetry we measured includes some many false asymmetry from the beam because there's some difference in the beam position, angle, energy uh, with beams, in beams with different holistic. So we need to remove these false asymmetries. And then after that, we need to collect some background asymmetries like the inner scattering and then the non-linearity in the detectors and acceptance function, etc. After get these physical paradigmatic asymmetries to integrate our results, that is to connect our measurements to theoretical predictions, then we will need the so-called uh, acceptance function. And with these acceptance functions, we can make uh, theoretical predictions with various theoretical models and compare it to our uh, experimental measurements. Can I also just sure. to, uh, we have this charge, uh, charge collected. <clears throat> How do I convert these uh, charges into some kind of, uh, of events? Interesting events. Oh, this so is, this is a charge of collecting charge after all the background rejected, like just no, this background is, charge? Or? 
So the blue is a large charge, and this that is what we call blue charge. That's some simple card we apply. Online. So just all the electrons. Yes. You're collected. But so you just just divide the charge by the charge of an electron, then you then you know how many electrons we collect. Okay, but are all those events are useful or only the so red ones? Okay, are they are all used. But this is huge number of events, right? Okay. Oh yes. Uh so this is for CLS. It has about uh, 82 million events. No, this is not number of electrons, this US. US means that, so this is an identification of events. So let me, like the velocity frequency, uh, frequency will be about 120 hertz or 240 hertz for PLS frequency X. Well, if the frequency is 120 hertz, then we will combine every four continuous velocity uh, windows to get a 30 hertz quarter piece. That, that's to cancel the 60 hertz line noise. So this is what we call one event. So that, that one event will have, you see that so many electrons collect in four velocity windows. And a lot of asymmetry measure is Friday values. You see that's a, a Friday factor. This is a secret value. Nobody knows that until I'm writing. So the right two parts show the uh, asymmetries, uh, law asymmetry measurement. The top part is the average, that's the average between the left and right HIS. The, the bottom one is the double difference. So the top part will be what we want to measure. And the bottom part can be used to monitor the data quality because ideally the difference between the flight will be zero as you can see That our, uh, this is uh, almost a uh, Gaussian fit gives a uh, mean value very close to zero. So I guess uh, my question is like, <clears throat> if then you measure asymmetry with some statistical uncertainty, right? Yes. Is this a statistical uncertainty of that? It just depends on how many events you have or? Yes. Or, 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 or always, suppose you have a higher frequency, you would get in fact get more events. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, it's also the statistical uncertainty on the, on the asymmetry is only Coming from those that those case forms on the right, but yes. suppose you have a higher frequency in the group. No, suppose you instead of thirty first, you have a three hundred first. You will have ten times more, more events, right? If you follow the same. Oh, this is controlled by felicity. No, so so if you have so for example here we have one twenty hertz uh, fitting helicities. Then we combine every four continuous uh, helicity windows. If you have 240 hertz frequency, uh, frequency, frequency, we will combine every eight continuous electron pins so that we can keep a, a constant 30 hertz uh, event frequency. That's to cancel the, the 60 hertz line noise. So anyway, we will finally get the... My question is whether the, the, your, your precision is controlled by the integrated charge or is limited by by the by number of events. So this is fleeting. Which one is limiting your, your, your final statistical precision? The, the holistic fleeting doesn't control uh, the uh, statistical uncertainty. So just no matter what the uh, holistic fleeting frequencies, we finally get the 30 hertz uh, event rate. So it just depends on how many times, how many days we can run our experiments. So that the fast asymmetry mainly come from the, the fluctuation in being various beam parameters, like being position, being angle, being energy. So you can see that this is the stop wise. So that stop means that all uh, event runs that we collect between two change of the insertable half replace. So you can see that the, the beam parameters, the fluctuation is very small, but non-zero. Then you can see that at the, like the difference, position difference at the nanometer level and the angle difference at the nanoradian levels, but there's still some non-zero values. Therefore, we need to correct this fast asymmetry. <coughs> so there are a few methods to do it. First is the regression, as you can see that. We see that the trend, from, from with asymmetry, so this is left and right asymmetry against the 
fluctuation in either beam position or beam energy. Therefore, it's natural to use the regression method because the fluctuation is small. Therefore, the first order regression is good enough. Then we just to calculate the difference between the law asymmetry and the true asymmetries, the minimization of this distance value will give us the so called store values that will, can be used to collect the false asymmetry. Another method is the so called beam moderation. That is, we can introduce. Oh, we can introduce the uh, fluctuations manually, then we can uh, record the response uh, of detector or the monitor with respect to this beam modulation and then calculate the self values directly. Finally, we can combine these two methods because both uh, suffer from their own limitations. So the regression is precise but not accurate, while the differing is accurate but not precise. Therefore, we try to combine that to, to get advantage from both methods. So the Lagrangian like multiplier is actually just the regression with constraint from the beam modulation. Then here shows you the results that you can see that the, our uh, corrections that remove the uh, dilution caused by the false asymmetry. And here shows the comparison of the result from these three methods. We see quite good agreement between them. Now I want to talk about the results. So with these two formulas, then following these formulas, we can get the physical asymmetries step by step. And then uh, with, uh, with the unbranded uh, factors, then we can know the final physical parity, parity violating asymmetries. So PLEX2 measured 550 parts per billion, and CLEX measured 2,670 2, parts per billion. Right. You can see the uncertainties of our measurements are both statistically limited. One second. Asymmetry should be less than one. How do you get the okay. part This part per billion. Part per billion. So like multiplied by something? Ten to the yes. Ten to the minus ten. Oh, okay. Then with these asymmetry values, we can so with the formula that I introduced in the intro introduction part, then we can calculate the uh, weak form factors. So this is the result from PLEX can see that. So remember up to this step, this with these results are all precise. There's no theoretical uncertainties. Then to convert the weak form factor to the uh, weak radius, then we need some uh, uh, theoretical assumptions. That is, we assume the two parameter uh, Fermi function distribution, that's the root section distribution functions. Then with you see that's a, a series of models that predict the uh, relationship between the weak radius and the parity asymmetry we measured. So let's a linear relationship, then with the quantity we measured, we will extract the weak radius, and on the hand side is the weak neutron spin thickness. So the result is shown here. So PLEX to measure the neutron spin thickness of 0 0.28, and select measure 0 0.12 uh, centimeter. Then again, with the uh, series of density functional theories, we can get the correlation between the density dependent of symmetry energy with respect to the neutron spin thickness we measured. That will extract the density dependence at a saturation density will be 106 uh, MBV, and then at the nuclear set, uh, density that's about 0. Point, about two thirds of the saturation density is about 71 MBV. So we see that uh, if we compare our PLEX to and CLEX result with a series of theoretical model predictions, we see that few theoretical models can predict our measurements simultaneously in 90% uh, joint probability intervals. You see that on the left hand side is the difference in the charge form factor and the weak form factor. On the right hand side is the neutron skin thickness. Only so this are uh, a series of relativity and non-relativity uh, density functional theory predictions. Only so on the left side, only a few of them uh, uh, fix our measurements on the right hand side. Uh, so let's extra two initial calculations. One is couple cluster, one is the dispersive optical models. So that means that models from both sides 
experimental and theoretical size are needed to accommodate the difference between the theoretical precision and our experimental measurements. Then we go to come to uh, separation densities. So we know the proton distribution already. Now from the uh, weak uh, one factor, we know the uh, weak distribution, uh, weak charge distribution, and then we can know the neutron distributions from which we can extract the uh, baryon distributions. This is the sum of the uh, proton and neutrons. Let's to let's extract to be 0 0.148 uh, inverse cube centimeter. And this quantity is almost equal to the nuclear separation densities. So that's a factor very close to one, about 1.03. That can get the uh, nuclear saturation density. So this is our measurements. The nuclear saturation density is measured to be 0 0.15 inverse cube pentameter. And the implication of our measurements on the uh, neutron, uh, the radius of a neutron star. So we can see that the PLX measurements, so this is the green part. This is the, so the top is our measurement of a neutron speed is about 0 0.28. And the corresponding uh, radius of a neutron star is about 13 to 15 kilometers. While the NASA that measures the light curve of a neutron stars, so it can also infer the uh, radius of a neutron star. So it uh, range the one sigma range of NASA will be 12 to 14.3. So let me see quite large overlap. That means that our result is consistent with the NASA observation. But with the LIGO observation, so let's the uh, origin line here. So from the uh, LIGO observation, it sets the upper limit on a parameter so-called uh, deformability that Betty already explained. So it said the, the upper limit is of about 590s. allows only one theoretical prediction. As you can see here, this uh, blue dot is a theoretical prediction. But this dot is outside the, the one sigma range of our PLEX uh, predict measurements. Therefore, that's, um, I would say that's a mild tension of our measurements with the uh, LIGO observations. Finally, uh, it has some implications on the uh, so PLEX will possess uh, <coughs> vessel densities. So this is a uh, neutrino emission cooling process. And from our measurements with some neutron star models, our measurements of the neutron skin index of 0.28 corresponding to a uh, vessel density uh, about 0.24 inverse cube, inverse cube pentameters. And the corresponding mass threshold of such, allows such a uh, cooling process to happen is about 0 0.85 solar mass. So, but just a few of us. So the transverse asymmetry, well, this is some interesting thing. So this asymmetry is actually pretty conserving. It's different from what we talking about before. You see that this is pure uh, electromagnetic process and the asymmetry comes from the interference between one photon exchange and two photon exchange. So you see that the asymmetry has a uh, azimuthal angle dependence. So experimentally, we can choose this angle. So in our experiment, we can set it to be 90 degrees Therefore, we don't need to care about uh, this, uh, this factor in the expression. Then following exactly the same uh, process, data analysis and systematic uncertainty uh, calculation, we come to the result. So you can see, uh, we also include a PLEX1 result here. So we find that for light nucleus, like nuclei, like calcium, uh, carbon, calcium 40, and calcium 40, the asymmetry, the transverse asymmetry of these light nuclei are not far away from the theoretical conditions as shown by these uh, lines. But for heavy nuclear that led to it, we found that the measurement is constantly zero at different Q, uh, Q points. So this is something that we still cannot understand. Uh, so we summarize that uh, PLEX2 and CLEX make precise measurement of the neutron skin thickness of lead 208 and calcium. So with these measurements, it will constrain the nuclear models and the density dependence of the symmetry energy. As for the transverse asymmetry measurements, like for light nuclei, the, our measurement agree with theoretical predictions, but not for heavy nuclear. Thank you.
Oops. So the extraction of uh, the neutron scan for calcium in the lab is model dependent, right? And you have some uncertainty that is associated with that model dependence. How is that uncertainty determined? And is it determined only on like two classes of EFP or is it general? Well, what's going on there? So you mean uncertainty in this expression? No, whenever you go to the R, the R skin value, you can go there. Because you, you show some theoretical uncertainties that are coming from the model of energy. Yeah, Kevin. Can you look at the question again? Yeah, so Rn minus Rp, there's a, a value that you say is the neutron scan for the intercalcium. There's an experimental uncertainty there, and then there's a theoretical uncertainty. So this slide is the theoretical predictions for some covariant EDF uh, energy density function. Yes, this is a serious of density functional theories. So just two classes, though. I think there's uh, quite a lot of that's a uh, family of density functional theories here. You see that's F F U go uh L F three and then some others. I think a lot of these are similar functional forms, but uh, I think most of them are just relatively few models. Okay. Some of them are done by by the one who are in in Texas. Here and you see that's the one that we developed. Okay, we can discuss more of that. On a related point, so this means that we sort of assume this mean field uh, correlation. What if the correlation is slightly different in some other framework? So basically, this is not entirely model independent. I think there is some model dependence in the extraction of the radius and the scale. So that's that's one thing. Uh, Yes, well, the most strict statement is that our measurement is the least model dependent. It's not completely model independent. So, uh, on that point, I also have a question with this uh, equation that we showed. It's not exact, it's approximate. Which is the definition of the factor with the asymmetry. Oh, so this this just show you the approximation, but in our analysis, it includes actually the Coulomb uh, corrections, so that that result is actually accurate. Well, so then my question is, in including that Coulomb correction again, do you have also? Yeah, what is the model dependence that could uh, could come to this formula? So let's should include the. <clears throat> That should include in this theoretical uncertainty in the calculation of the form factors. Okay, but the, the formula itself is approximate. So there's yeah. other uncertainty goes there, right? So this, to... we don't exactly follow uh, this formula. So this just show you, uh, give you a feel that's how, how to okay. connect the asymmetry and the form factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you really please discuss again that tra 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 I didn't really get the point there. Okay, so you mean the result of the uh, measurement? So you were talking about the tra transverse uncertainty or tra transverse asymmetry? Yeah, transverse asymmetry, and there was it didn't agree with what you expected, or uh, can you go through yes. that again? Because I didn't catch the point there. So you see that for light nucleus, that the measurement agrees with the theoretical prediction, well, not far away from mm -hmm. theoretical prediction, but for uh, lateral A, so it's pretty good as this that line you see, but our measurement is constantly zero. So that's a um, huge deviation. The physics are, uh, uh, I, I relate to the neutron scale, right? It's different physics? No. Okay, okay, okay. so they are connected? No. <laughs> oh. So this, this is, well, so we measure it because uh, itself is a systematic under okay. for our parity variety is which measurement. And then another reason is that in PLS1, we measure, we found it to be zero. That's something. 
So even the zero x is also zero by the by yes. The so that we 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 measure it again in PS and CS so point still zero. So that's an that's an unexpected systematic error or something or. No, it already include uh, so, a certain set. So the yeah, problem point. is this a puzzle or this is some uh, indicating there's some issue? Or I would say a puzzle. There's a puzzle. Yeah, I have a question. You go back to that list of the um, uh, uncertainties and and the models. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. How can you say is that models are consistent? Because obviously, if you go and use each one of the model, you calculate the skin lab, it will not agree with the skin on the C rack or vice versa, right? This is only P rex only. This is only the. That's right. So all the model that you put in, that you say that. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I, I know. Go back to the, I don't want to, yeah. just these models, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight models in there, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that I believe those eight models, if it fit your lab, it will not fit your calcium 48. So something is wrong with those models. Yes, so let, we can only say that no models can predict uh, PDX, our PDX to NCX measures simultaneously. Yeah, so 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 your your analysis is model dependent. Oh yes. So in terms of extraction of the neutron spin thickness, yes. Okay. I just had a question about the selection of Q squared. So you only take one value of Q squared, mm -hmm. right? And is that because it's very difficult to do more than one? No, no. Because one gives that is enough. So let that from theoretical predictions, then we see a correlation between the uh, form factors and uh, and uh, neutron spins. So that one Q square one data points will in Q square will de identify the neutron spin in that two. But, but do you have data for another value Q squared, or do you use? We don't have. Are you, okay. Is there plans to do other? Uh, so that's no plan in J that. But that's a new experiment in maize in Germany that may continue measurement. I'm confused by this, but this is the form factor for a particular Q square value and how this correlates with the neutron scan. Yes. But, so that's the Q value you choose for the experiment or, or for a different Q square value? I don't remember this. Or is this extrapolation to zero Q square? Or I think it doesn't matter. So I think what this process says is that. With only one Q square points, we can identify the neutron spin. In. But my understanding yeah. is this: the uh, the lead and also the calcium for it are done with two different Q. Right. Mm -hmm. Two different, different Q two square. Two different values. Q square. Oh yes. Yeah. That that depends on the the choice of the scattering angle and beam energy. Yeah. You see, they have similar scanning angle, but they have different beam angles. Oh, okay. So this depends on something we call a big of Mary's. So let's, this also come from theoretical calculations. Then you see that the sensitivity of the asymmetry measurement to the uncertainty in the neutron skin thickness that will uh, minimize at some uh, beam energy and scattering angle. You mean your figure married is that dark A or A, right? You want to get the best relative uh, that's, that's, the, that's the product of all these three quantities. Uh, you reach a maximum value at, at that angle. Oh, yes. So, that for uh, the epsilon, that's what we call sensitivity, that we want to maximize this value. So, that's about five degrees. And then, in terms of the scattering rate and the asymmetry value itself, that also uh, support a small, smaller scattering angle and uh, corresponding beam energy. 